In this short video, we're going to talk about coordinate vectors and matrices that can represent general transformations. So if we think back to Euclidean spaces, we're able to get a lot of information from the matrix representation of a linear transformation. If we went to the standard matrix, we could calculate its null space. That would give us a, a basis for the kernel of t. The null space of the matrix was the kernel of t. The column space of the matrix was the same as the range of t. And based on that information, we can make decisions as to uh, if t were 1 to 1 or onto, possibly both, or maybe neither. So having a matrix is really, really valuable. So if we have general finite dimensional vector spaces, so we'll limit this discussion to finite dimensional vector spaces, and we have a linear transformation between those two vector spaces, then we can find a matrix representation of T. And that's going to be really nice. Now, I'm going to warn you right now that some of the notation here might get a little bit complicated. But bear with me, in particular, pay close attention to the examples, because the ideas are really not that hard. And so it's just difficult to express them carefully in a mathematical notation. Uh, so pay attention to the examples. So here's an idea that we saw in a previous video, that we can represent a vector using components derived from a different and possibly non-standard basis. That's the idea of a coordinate vector. So you have a vector, which looks like a vector. It is a vector in Rn or Rm. And uh, its components are numbers. Those numbers are the coefficients on the basis vectors. Uh, so here's the idea, right? You have a uh, ordered basis. And for a subspace W, and then a vector V and W. Well, it, it, since it's a basis, you can write V as a linear combination. So you'll have coefficients. Those are real numbers, C1, C2, up to Cn, on each of the corresponding basis vectors. And that will have to add up to V. So we take those coefficients, we put those in a vector as components, and that's what we call a coordinate vector. And now, note that the coordinate vector does depend on your choice of basis. So it really will change. If you choose a different basis, you'll get a different coordinate vector. And that's why we're going to see a lot of subscripts telling us which basis we're using. Now, if it's clear, uh, we won't always have the subscript. So like in this bottom part here, we put the B to say this is the vector V in the basis B, and its coordinates are the following. Sometimes, to, to clarify, when we put these angle brackets, we might even put a B on the angle brackets to make it clear. Or if we write it as a column vector, we might also put a little b subscript on the column vector to emphasize that this is a coordinate vector uh, written with respect to the basis b. So let's start with a simple example from R3. We have a basis as three vectors. And at this stage, you should be able to easily tell that B is a basis for R3. There's three vectors, so we can use the two for one theorem. So all we would need to know is that either those vectors are linearly independent or that they span the space. And, and we'll see. If you can't see right away, we'll see uh, how it's easy to tell that it is a linearly independent set. So let's just choose uh, some other vector with components 0, 3, and 1. So v is just a chosen vector from R3. And we'd like to find its coordinate vector with respect to this new basis, 
b. That is, we would need to find coefficients c1, c2, and c3 such that this linear combination of basis vectors adds up to our given vector 0, 3, 1. So we'll start by writing that using column vectors or column matrices. It's the same equation, just written column-wise. But now we can see, oh, we have on the right-hand side a linear combination of column vectors. And we can rewrite that as a matrix vector multiplication. And now when I look at the matrix here, so each column of the matrix represents one of the basis vectors in order. And I can see that this is an upper triangular matrix. None of the diagonal matrix, I'm sorry, none of the diagonal entries are zero, which means that this matrix is invertible. And if that matrix is invertible, then we know that its columns must be linearly independent. And so that's how we know one of the ways that we can tell that that set of vectors in B must be a basis for R3. So great. Since uh, that is an invertible matrix, then we know that we're going to have a unique solution. But we don't need to calculate the inverse. It's very easy just to uh, solve this uh, directly. The first equation does tell us that C3 is 1. And then if C3 is 1, then we can use back substitution to find C2 and C1. And once we know them, then we know the components of the coordinate vector with respect to B. So our original vector with respect to the standard basis was 0, 3, 1. With respect to B, its coordinate vector is negative 3, 2, 1. So this connection, and we can see this, this connection between the basis and the coordinate vector uh, is a linear transformation. And how do I know that? Well, let's go back. How did we find that coordinate vector? We solved this linear system which had an invertible matrix. This matrix will always be invertible because its columns come from a basis. So it's always going to be a square matrix and it's always going to be invertible. So since it's invertible we could have just found C1, C2, C3 by multiplying the inverse of this matrix times that vector. And so the inverse of this matrix would be the standard matrix representation of this linear transformation. And so since you can represent it with a matrix, of course, it's a linear transformation. And uh, as we just saw, if our uh, input space is Rn, then it's 1 to 1 and onto, meaning that's invertible. And it's a, that other word we had, isomorphism. So now let's look at something in a, a more abstract vector space, like a polynomial space. So we're going to have an nth degree polynomial. And we know that a basis for Pn is just the uh, set of monomials whose exponents go from 0 up to n. So it's very easy then to find the coordinate vector. It's just the coefficients. So the coefficients starting with the constant coefficient all the way up to the highest coefficient. So for example, if I have the polynomial 3 minus 5x plus 7x squared plus x cubed, we do have to pay attention to the order. And some of the examples were going in ascending order, which is the standard way. Sometimes we do something non-standard and go in descending order. But here we're going in ascending order. So the coordinate vector would just be 3, then negative 5, then 7, then 1. So the the components are constant coefficient, coefficient on x, coefficient on x squared, coefficient on x cubed. 
So here I have 4x plus x cubed. So again, remember that this is the constant coefficient. This is the coefficient on x, the coefficient on x squared, the coefficient on x cubed. So I have 1x cubed plus 0x squared plus 4x plus 0. And again, we have to pay attention to the order. All right, so here I've written the polynomial in descending order, but our basis vectors go in ascending order. So 8 being the constant is going to go in the first slot. And then negative 6 is the coefficient on x. That goes in the second slot. 9 is the coefficient on x squared. And there is no x cubed term, meaning that the coefficient on x cubed is 0. So what if we use a different basis? So here we have, again, four polynomials. Remember, P3 has dimension 4. If we're going to show that this is a basis, we need to know, well, we have the right number of uh, vectors. There's four of them. We just need to know that they are linearly independent. And we know that they're linearly independent because the degree of the first one is 0, then the degree of the second one is 1, then the degree of the third one is 2, and the last one has a degree of 3. All of the degrees are different. And so whenever you have a set of polynomials with different degrees, that set is linearly independent. So we have four of them, and they're linearly independent. So we have a basis. So now, if I want to take the same polynomial, the first example that we used with the standard basis, remember, with the standard basis, it was very simple. Uh, it was, its coordinate vector was just 3, comma, negative 5, comma, 7, comma, 1. You were just using the coefficients. But we don't have the standard basis now. We have b prime. So what we need to do are find new coefficients such that the linear combination of our basis vectors and basis polynomials uh, equals the given polynomial. And that's just an algebra problem. We're just going to collect the like terms. So everything that uh, is multiplied by a constant here has to equal 3. That's how I get 2c0 minus 3c1 plus 7c2 and then plus 2c3. And then we look at the coefficients on x. I have a negative 5 on the left and then I'll have a c1, nothing from here, and then minus 5c3. And then for the x squared coefficients I have 7 here. I've got a c2 and 4c3. And then finally, for the cubic, uh, I only have uh, 1 on this side and c3 on the right-hand side. So you can solve this. It's very easy because we were given c3 now equals 1. And we can use back substitution to find c2 and then c1 and then finally c0. And so the solution then is... Uh, c3 equals 1, c2 equals 3, c1 is 0, c0 is negative 10. So I just have to remember to put them in order. Remember our ordered basis uh, started with 2, then went to x minus 3, and so on. And so the c0 comes first, then the c1, and then c2, and finally c3. That is the coordinate vector of this polynomial with respect to the new basis b prime. Again, it's just the coefficients that we use in that linear combination. So let's go and review the standard matrix for a linear transformation. The standard matrix in Euclidean space is simply the matrix whose columns are the images of the standard basis vectors. So given the standard basis vectors, 
Uh, remember, the st standard basis vector E1 has a 1 in the first component and zeros elsewhere. E2 is 0 except for in the second component where it's 1, and so on. And if we have that, then we can use the matrix to uh, compute the uh, image of a vector. We do that with a matrix vector product. Uh, it winds up being a linear combination of those columns of that standard matrix. Mm -hmm. If we look at it this way, here's the standard matrix. Each column is here. And we multiply it times the vector whose components are uh, x1 through xn. So let's look at this with general transformations uh, with finite dimensional vector spaces. And let's start with something fairly similar. We're going to use a P2 and the set of 2 by 2 matrices. And I'm going to do something a little different here because it's P2 quadratics. We're so used to looking at quadratics as AX squared plus BX plus C. Um, we're going to write the quadratic this way instead of C0 plus C1x plus C2x squared. And then the output is a 2 by 2 matrix. The 1 by 1 entry is going to be the coefficient on x squared. The off-diagonal entries are going to be the coefficient on x. And then the 2, 2 entry is going to be the constant in the polynomial. So for the basis of P2, we're going to write the basis vectors in descending order. So x squared, x, and 1. So it lines up with the way we're writing the polynomial as ax squared plus bx plus c. So then the coordinate vector for ax squared plus bx plus c would just have components a, b, c in that order. So our basis vectors now, we've got three of them. We're going to label them as P1, P2, and P3. So P1 is x squared. If I write P1 x squared, its coordinate vector, remember it's always a, b, c. So in this particular uh, vector, we just have a equals 1, b equals c equals 0. And then in our P2, what? We have a equals 0, b equals 1, and c equals 0. And then for p3, we have a equals b equals 0, and then c equals 1. And that's how we get these coordinate vectors then. If a is 1 and b and c are 0, then you get the coordinate vector 1, comma 0, comma 0. Remember, it's a, b, c. And then for P2, which is just x, its coordinate vector would be 0, 1, 0. And for P3, which is just 1, its coordinate vector is 0, 0, 1. All right, so that's for the input space. We are able to find coordinate vectors for a generic polynomial and for each of the basis vectors. Well, what are we going to use for the basis of 2 by 2 matrices? We're just going to use uh, the standard basis, which is a matrix, which is all zeros. And we just start up in the 1-1 uh, position and then go across to the 1-2 position, then 2-1, and finally 2-2. Two, two. That's where we put the 1 and everywhere else is 0. And so our image of a generic polynomial is the matrix with entries A, B, B, C. And that we can write as A times the first basis vector plus B times the second basis vector plus B times the third basis vector plus C times the fourth basis vector. So the coordinate vector for the image of our generic polynomial is going to be a vector in four space because the 
output space, the set of two by two matrices, is a four dimensional space. So we need to have four components. And it's just the coefficient on each of the basis vectors. And so we should be able to use that information to find a matrix representation of the T transformation. Because remember, the uh, matrix is just going to be a, uh, a matrix whose columns are the coordinate vectors of the image of the input basis vectors. So our input basis vectors, remember, were the polynomials. Remember this P1 was what? That was x squared. This is just x. And then this is 1, which means that the only non-zero value is a here. So that's why it's, remember, the a goes here. b and c are 0. With p of 2, p sub 2 of x equals x, it's b that equals 1. a and c are 0. So that's why I have 1s on the off diagonal. And along the diagonal, it's 0. And then finally, uh, with p of 3, that's just the function uh, p of x equals 1. So c equals 1. Everything else is 0. Well, each one of these matrices I can write as a linear combination of our basis vectors or basis matrices. And it's those coefficients, then, that give me my coordinate vectors. So now the idea is you want to take these coordinate vectors, which represent the images of the input basis vectors, and populate a matrix using those as columns. So let's review that idea, right? With a, with a Euclidean or a transformation on Euclidean spaces, the standard matrix was the matrix whose columns were the images of the standard basis vectors in the input space, right? In Rn. And so then we were able to use that matrix to apply the transformation. And we would get a vector then in Rm when we did that. So the way we're going to go about constructing our matrix T for the example where we're going from P2 into M2 by 2 is we're going to find a matrix T. And if we take that matrix T, if we multiply it by the coordinate vector of a polynomial in the input space, it's going to give me a coordinate vector in the output space, which would represent a 2 by 2 matrix. And the way we represent this matrix for T is that, again, we still use the brackets uh, to say that it's a matrix. But then we have two subscripts. We have the B and we have the B prime. The B is the basis of the input space. While B prime is the basis of the output space. So yeah, we get a lot of subscripts here, right? It's just, but it's so important that we keep track of what basis these coordinates vectors represent. So we take our polynomial, find its coordinate with respect to the input basis. And of course, that makes sense because the polynomial is the, it lives in the input space. The matrix lives in the output space. So its coordinate vector would have to be written with respect to the output space uh, basis. And then the uh, transformation matrix here, uh, 
has to be multiplied by some coordinate vector in the from the input space and then it produces output which is a coordinate vector in the output space so what will the columns will be well there'll be those vectors those coordinate vectors that we found which were the coordinate vectors for the images of the input basis vectors so we put those though as columns columns it's so important that we remember columns it's probably the most common mistake is people see these vectors and then they just put them in rows well again there is only one application in our linear algebra class where we'll ever ever put vectors as rows and that's only when you're trying to uh, find the basis for the orthogonal complement we're not talking about orthogonal complements here at all so every other place every other instance they're going to be going into the matrix as columns and so now if I take any the coordinate vector for any polynomial and multiply this matrix times that coordinate vector my output is a coordinate vector in four space and I can translate that four vector back to a two by two matrix and so um, what does that uh, as a two by two matrix what would that be well that would be the matrix a b b c so if i wanted to find for example t of 3x squared minus x plus 5 well it's very easy to do that directly but all i would need to do then would be to take this matrix 1 0 0 0 0 1 1 0 0 0 0 1 multiply it by 3 negative 1 and 5 and what will I get well I'll get 3 and then I'll have a negative 1 and another negative 1 and then 5 and that corresponds to it doesn't equal right I can't use an equals now because this is going to be um, a correspondence this is a vector and this is going to be a 2 by 2 matrix that would correspond to 3 negative 1 negative 1 5 as a 2 by 2 matrix now here is such a simple transformation you would say well, what's the point well you know if you don't write it out using a matrix you might be hard-pressed to answer the question which we'll look at in a in a future video is this transformation one-to-one -one, for example is it on two well from the matrix you can get that type of information easily all right so that was our example so suppose let's just have a general vector space v a general vector space w and a linear transformation between those two vector spaces where v is the domain and w is the codomain they're both finite dimensional so we'll need a basis for v uh, and uh, as is our custom the input space is going to be n dimensional so its dimension is n as in november and the output space has uh, dimension m as in mary right and so we have two sets of uh, so we have two bases b for the input b prime for the output so 
any input vector then, of course, can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors for the input space. And so the image of V can also be written as a linear combination of the in, I mean, of the images of the basis vectors for the space V. We just have to use uh, additivity and homogeneity. All right, so uh, that would give us, um, well, we haven't got anything yet because what we'd like to do is say, oh, these C1 to Cn, that's true. We could say that the uh, coordinate vector of our vector V and the basis B would just have those n components C1, C2, up to Cn. But we haven't got any idea of how to find the matrix for uh, this transformation yet. So what we need to do is find a coordinate vector for the image of V in the basis B prime. B prime is the basis of B. So here's the thing. These image vectors here uh, may or may not form a basis for W. So I can't just use uh, these components as my uh, coordinate vector in the output space. So I have to use components on the basis B prime, or coefficients. So the way we're going to find those coefficients is we're going to take each of the images of the basis vectors and say, oh, OK, that has to be a linear combination of the W vectors, because the W vectors form a basis for W, and the image of V1 is in W. So now I'm going to have, though, I have double subscripts uh, on these coefficients. Why is that? Well, one subscript is for the input basis vector. So this is the first input basis, input basis vector. And so the second uh, subscript is always going to be 1. And then the first subscript on these T entries uh, just represents that, oh, that is the coefficient on the W vector, the output vector, right? So T11 means that it's uh, a, a coefficient for the first input vector. It's the coefficient on the first output vector. T21 means 2 is the coefficient on the second output vector, and the 1 is for the first input vector. So that means the coordinate vector of T of V1 in the basis B prime would have those components, which are the coefficients. So T11, T21, up to Tm1. And I can do that with all of the images of the input basis vector. So for T of V2, I'll get a different uh, component vector here, but in the same way. Remember, this is T12 means that it is the coefficient on W1 for the image of V2. T22 means it's the coefficient on W2 for the image of T of V2. And so on. I can do the same thing for T3, and I go all the way up to Tn. So now I've got coordinate vectors for the images of all of the basis vectors in our input space. And so that should really give me all the entries that I need. I just have to remember to put these uh, coordinate vector components in as columns of my matrix. And let's see how that works out. Of course, we can uh, write then the image of my vector v as a linear combination then. Uh, this is what we saw before. 
we saw before that t of v, without having the coordinate part there, t of v is a linear combination of the images of the basis vectors. That just came from the additivity and homogeneity. And so it's also true of the coordinate vectors. So that means I could put those columns then, uh, or those uh, coordinate vectors, in as the columns of a matrix and perform that same operation through a matrix vector multiply. So what do we have here then? We have our basis vector written as a coordinate vector. So the image, I'm sorry, the image of V written as a coordinate vector with respect to the basis of the output matrix can be found by taking this matrix representation of T and multiplying it by these, uh, the uh, co coordinate vector of the vector v with respect to the input basis. Oh, that's a lot. And the, the notation that we use here, again, is the first subscript is the basis for the input space, and the second subscript is the basis for the output space. Well, let's, let's look at this again. So again, what do we have? We have the coordinate vector of the image of V in the basis of the output space is found by taking the matrix with respect to the input basis and output basis and multiplying it times the coordinate vector of V with respect to the input basis. And um, we do have one simplification. If we're dealing with an operator and B prime is the same as B, so we have the same input and the same output space, and we also are using the same basis, uh, then instead of writing T sub B comma B, we just write T sub B. So if we wanted to find then the image of V under this transformation using the matrix, there's really three steps that we have to perform. First, we have to take our input and encode it. That means find its coordinate vector. Find the coordinate vector with respect to the input basis. Then we have to go through and find the uh, coordinate vectors of the images of all of the input basis vectors. Those form the column of our matrix. And that's really the big work. And then it's just a matrix vector multiply. Now, what do I get out? I get a... Uh, component vector of the image of V, but with respect to the output basis. So to get the actual image of V, which is going to be something else, maybe it's a function, maybe it's a, a, a matrix, it's some other object to recover that, I have to uh, find what uh, object that would be by just saying, oh, let me just take these as coefficients times my basis vectors and then form this linear combination. So let's look at an example. And if you stayed with me this far, then pay close attention because this is where you're going to see that all of that abstract notation should start to make sense. So we're going to define a linear transformation from P3 into P2. And what we'll do is we'll take a polynomial of degree 3 or less, and we'll form an output polynomial this way. So let's make sure that the output polynomial is in P2. If I take the derivative of something in P3, the highest degree that could be is 2, 
and I'm just multiplying that times 5. The second derivative, its highest degree is, could be 1, so I multiply a 1 degree polynomial times another 1 degree polynomial, so its degree is at most uh, 2. And then finally, p of negative 3, that's just a real number, and I'm multiplying that times x squared, and so the degree there would also be at most 2. So the degree of the output is exactly 2. So the output is space is indeed P2 based on this definition. And so we would like to find the, mat the standard matrix uh, for this transformation because it could save us some work because here you'd have to take a first derivative and a second derivative and then do an evaluation and then take that linear combination and that would be a lot of work. If I just had the standard matrix then I could just do a matrix vector multiply. So to find it I need a basis for the input space so P3. I need a basis for the output space which is P2 and we're going to use the standard basis in ascending order here. So just powers, ascending powers of x. So what do I need to do? In order to find the matrix for t, its columns are going to be the coordinate vectors for the images of our basis polynomials. So the input space is P3, so we have four basis polynomials, 1, x, x squared, and x cubed. Uh, to find out their images, though, I'm going to have to use, well, just the power rule to find p prime and p double prime. So I'll find the first derivative and the second derivative. And then I'll just use this given formula to find their images. So t of 1, well, um, the derivative and the second derivative are 0, so the only thing I need to look at is x squared times p of negative 3, but the p of, when p of x equals 1, then p of neg p1 of negative 3 is also 1. So I'm just going to have 1 times x squared, which gives me x squared. Uh, for t of x, the first derivative is 1, so I'm going to have 5. And then uh, p of uh, negative 3 is negative 3, so I have 3x squared. The second derivative is 0. And so on. I just go ahead and uh, find then the images of t of x squared and t of x cubed by using their first and second derivatives and the given formula. So for this part, I have to use the given formula. Now what I need to do, these are just polynomials, right? This is the, the output polynomials that I would find from this linear transformation. All of them are polynomials in P2. I want to write them as, or, or find their coordinate vectors in the basis for P2. So remember the basis B prime, uh, again, its basis, the basis was B prime starts with 1, then goes to x and x squared. So the first component is the coefficient on 1, the second component is the coefficient on x, and the third component is the coefficient of x squared. So in my first uh, image polynomial, I just have x squared. So that means 0 times 1 plus 0 times x plus x squared. And then negative 3x squared plus 5, I'll have 5 in the constant slot, 0 as the coefficient on x, and negative 3 as the coefficient on x squared. For 9x squared plus 6x minus 14, uh, again, we just have to be careful of the order. Minus 14 is the constant. That goes in the first component. 6 is the coefficient on x. That's in the second component. And then 9x squared, that goes in the, the 9 goes in the third component. And then finally, negative 24x squared, so negative 24 is in the third component. Minus 42x, that's in the second component. There is no constant, well, we just say that's plus 0 then. So then these vectors, 
I place them as the columns. Again, let's just emphasize columns, columns, columns. Put this in as the first column, second column, third column, fourth column. That is the matrix representation of this transformation. And so now, if I want to find the uh, output when the input is 2 plus 3x minus 5x squared plus x cubed, rather than using the formula directly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first encode, that is change that input polynomial and write its coordinate vector. And with respect to the standard basis, that's easy. We just uh, have the coefficients of in ascending order of degree. So it's already written in ascending order, so it would just be 2, 3, negative 5, 1. We found the matrix already. We did all that work. So now we just have to take that matrix and multiply it times those coefficients. And of course, this multiplication should be defined. And if you ever get yourself into a situation where your multiplication is not defined, then you probably made a mistake about not putting the vectors in as columns. So put them in as columns. Perform that multiplication, and then you get this output vector. It only has three components, which is good because the output space is P2. And remember, these coefficients then correspond to, again, this is going to be the constant coefficient, the coefficient on x, and then the coefficient on x squared. So then let us take that vector and change it back into the appropriate object for the output space, which would be a polynomial. So it's 85 times 1 minus 72 times x minus 76 times x squared. And maybe we want to write that in a descending order if that's a little bit more natural. But we could just leave it as 85 minus 72x minus 76 x squared. So the uh, standard matrix is going to be so useful uh, because in the next section we're going to be looking at how can we tell if a general linear transformation is one-to-one -one or onto. And if we have its standard matrix, then we can just look at its uh, reduced row echelon form and find the basis of the null space and the basis of the column space.